Hello, and welcome to Generation AI, the podcast where we demystify artificial intelligence in the world of higher education. I'm your host, Artis Kadu, and join me with me today is my co-host, Dr. JC Bonilla. Hey, JC. I, I, wanted, I wanted to add a couple of um, kind of adjectives in there. I saw you like your body language getting there, like getting ready to like say something awesome, and it just dropped, you know, and JC. Well, I'm doing good, Artis. How you doing? Two weeks in a new gig and I have gotten fired, so I'm doing good. <laughs> I know, I know. You're, you're surviving. How's your, your boss? Uh, asshole, uh, but it's fine. I'm, I'm surviving, everybody. Hey. I'm still here. <laughs> As you know, Artis and I are working back together. Art, Art is becoming my big boss, and it's always fun to see him in his element, uh, no pun intended. And um, good, you know, good uh, solid two weeks. My friend, you've built an awesome company. So fun to see the unpacking and the meaningful things. So all of you Element friends listening to our voices, I'm very impressed with what you've done. And thank you for the awesome welcome to the Element family. JC the Boomerang. <laughs> Ch- that's right, JC the Boomerang. Maybe I should do the intro one, one more time. Uh, my my awesome co-host, the <laughs> Boomerang JC Bonilla, everybody. The Boomerang JC. Artis, how's your health? Um, I've been feeling a little bit under the weather. It's like walking pneumonia. I think that's what I got diagnosed with. So hopefully my voice is a little bit better this time around. Everybody, we've been talking in this podcast about all this mileage that he is, you know, packing and, and how his family is going to benefit from this. But Artis broke. Not, I mean, think about like, I don't know, how many airports have you seen in the past month? Like... 82? I don't know, man. I, I usually consider myself pretty resilient to sickness, so. It's, um, it's, it's we've, we've seen you uh, everywhere, so f- yeah, sometimes the body sends us a signal, which is basically slow down, so thank God for science and meds. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So we're, I'm on the mend. I will be missing uh, AMA, which is happening right now, and the Element team is there, so if you, if you're still at AMA, please stop by and say hi to them. We're throwing an awesome, with, wait, probably by the time this comes out, we threw an awesome party Sunday night at, um, uh, and of course, this is in Vegas at Caesars, Caesars Palace, the real Caesars Palace. A lot of minds being challenged, a lot of AI conversations, and a lot of livers also being treated as we speak, because there's a lot of drinking that takes place in those things. So, <laughs> Artists, you and I spoke about what this episode should be all about, and we want to be sensitive, contemporary, and also walk a really fine line of elections post-analysis, obviously under the lens of higher education and all things AI. Maybe what we should start with is what is this podcast not about today, right? Uh, Because although we're going to be using the lens of elections, this is not about, we're not a political uh, commentary type of podcast. So artists, from your point of view, what is this not about uh, as we unpack election talks? Yeah, certainly this is not about, you know, uh, certain political views or one party or another or about individuals, you know, so this is, except for Elon, right? So I'm going to, I'm going to just leave that aside, (laughs) Uh, but it is not about a political views. So we're going to talk today about kind of, you know, maybe a little bit of what we think between JC and I, what we think the impact can be uh, of this new administration and from everything that we've absorbed and we know today uh, and the news, what we think, how is that going to impact kind of the adoption of AI or the acceleration of AI? And then also, um, you know, probably some of the education and how we think about that in the education space. And then the last uh, topic that we're going to talk about, which is very, very fresh, is a, it's a really, really interesting one. Uh, and it goes back to kind of companies in the age of AI and education. We're going to talk about, there's a new, an article today in the Wall Street Journal on Chegg. So for those of you who don't know Chegg, uh, so the name of the article is How Chad GPT Brought Down an Online Education Giant. So we're going to talk about all of those different topics uh, and, and try to um, have an episode where it's going to be a lot of opinion for sure, but uh, hopefully we'll give you some, some kind of a, a peek in how we're thinking about it. Yeah. And everybody, this is a reaction to a new government. It's going to start marching and bring in a view in January 1st, I mean, January 6th, right? 20th. Next year, 20th. I, I'm 
Anyway, next year. And this is not about whether it's the right government or the right government, how I think and how I feel about this government. This is all about understanding that the agendas and the policies that the government will institute, how do they affect all things AI and the repercussions that we could see. This has the good and the bad towards our favorite topic, all things higher education. So art is probably the best way to start, in my opinion, right? It's there's a current legal construct, right, of AI that the Biden administration turns out. And it's very common for administrations to look back retrospectively at prior administration and revoke, remove, and kind of start from scratch. So whether that policy is a good one and whether we like the regulatory things that it does on, a, on all things AI, this Biden AI agenda probably, probably will not, has his days counted. So thoughts on that, Artis? Yeah, I, th I think, you know, kind of a, a victory here for, for the Republicans or the GOP means that there is, it, it's expected to roll back the existing AI regulations and kind of have a more hands-off approach to governance around AI. And we are seeing this already, or this is something that, you know, as you're, you know, as you're bringing in folks like Elon and so on and so forth, that's the the hands-off, you know, approach. Even though Elon was for AI regulation, that's, there's going to be a healthy tension there for sure. But certainly that executive order, uh, EO will be kind of rolled back and everybody that's, that's what they think about. So, uh, if you don't remember what that executive order was, it was around regulating, um, how big this models can be before they get, you know, announced to the government who's responsible for the downstream effects of those models and the, the safety and the training on them and, and how com much compute you can use to, to kind of train them and so on and so forth. So, so a lot of those regulations will be rolled back. Yeah, there's five uh, components, uh, safety and effective systems, algorithmic discrimination, data privacy, notice and explanation, and human altercations, considerations, and fallback. So our first forecast predictor here is this probably moves away and a replacement or a different viewpoint will be unpacked. Let's talk about that. And you, you said, you know, regulation is going to be important. I think and that's the second derivative of this. We know a Republican government has a different approach to regulation of big tech. Yep. The Biden administration, a bit more heavy handed. And that's the other manifestation that I'm actually excited about. Mergers and acquisitions, specifically big guys buying small guys, big no no. We saw Microsoft doing very clever things so that they can have this super gigantic AI portfolio, right? So from acquisitions of companies and buying the companies so you can get the people to like, you know, weird, you know, in partnerships and infusion of cash and funding, like the you know, open AI, multiple things. With the new administration, we should probably see that it's easier for a giant to be saying, hey, I want to buy you because I love your tech and now you're part of, you know, AWS, Google, Meta and things like that, right? Thoughts on... Merger acquisitions, big guy taking over, exciting new tech, emerging new tech? Yeah, I mean, the Federal Trade Commission, like the FTC, um, they've been really anti-mergers and acquisitions. Uh, Lena Khan, which is the um, the person in charge there, regulator. Uh -huh. the regulator, they've been really against it, and they've blocked quite a few of those, specifically on the pharma side, but but even on the big tech side, that's that's not there. And And one of the things that's really important for the ecosystems is how these companies and the VCs and the investors that are investing in these companies, they can't make their money back unless they, these companies are bought out by bigger companies or they go public. So there's very, very few companies that have gone public and there's not a lot of liquidity coming back. They can invest in more. Obviously there's a lot of money out there, but the founders or the people who are part of these companies or those employees or those le that leadership team and, right. and so on and so forth, what we usually see in an ecosystem where you have a lot of mergers and acquisitions is that there is there is money now going into these founders and there is money going into employees and so on and so forth. And what that leads to is a secondary effect where those founders and those employees now go on to form new companies and the startups and so on and so forth. So so that that's kind of the effect of of that you know that that money or that liquidity being back coming back. So. 
my hope is that that will kind of start happening. And as that happens, the obvious place where that those startups and, and that huge uh, emergence of these companies can come into without as much regulation. So you take both of those, right? So you take the ability to have more and then you take the regulation, some of the regulation away and make it easier, then AI is the natural place or the natural uh, way to start thinking about these companies. So they're going to be AI first companies and solving specific problems in all kinds of industries. But education is another, it's, it's one that's, you know, at element, we are trying to disrupt it by, you know, kind of building these AI first engagement platforms, a system or record, but we're going to see that happening in a more accelerated way in a lot of different places as well. So I'm, I'm going to play back what you said, because I, I, th I think it's on the money. And what we expect with the release of AMAs, right, or basically the deregulation of a, uh, AMAs, there is a really interesting first derivative of, you know, the company gets acquired. So second derivative is that the people who got acquired benefit from that trade and probably naturally are starting new businesses. And what we also think is that if there is a new business or you're going to start a new startup, chances are that is either AI adjacent or AI first uh, type of companies. So from an AI point of view, we are foreseeing a very bull market, if you will, for anything's AI and in, in innovation in AI, if you will. Adjacent to AI, also it's important to remember that this administration, it's a bit, it's it's friendlier towards Bitcoin, blockchain, all that type of machinery. And it'll be interesting to see if there is a Bitcoin, blockchain, AI phase emerging. Artis, how, how do you feel about the, literally the startup world, right? So if this is not big money starting a company, but you know, the, the um, the company is started by that student that goes into a Y community type of program. How does this administration impact benefits, or how should we be thinking about the artists of the world twenty years ago? Right. So I have this passion, I have these these ideas, and then here I go creating a company. But literally, it's just me and maybe in my dorm room. So how do I think about that small version of a startup? Um, I mean there is there's a lot more opportunities right so where there's there's a reward on the other side there is a lot of people who are willing to take that risk and and get there now what we can see is kind of a i would say an acceleration of that but well let me take a step back what we have today jc with ai is the ability for one entrepreneur or two entrepreneurs to make a much bigger impact and to build a company that is much bigger without needing a lot more capital and a lot bigger investment because AI can be an accelerator and can be a tool that, you know, you can do a lot more with. So we're seeing the big, we're probably going to see the beginnings of, if you remember, we talked before where Sam Altman said, AI will be able to have you know, we're going to have to have a 10 person company, a billion dollar unicorn or billion dollar 10 person company. So we're going to be starting to see that happening over the next couple of years. So that entrepreneur will be able to do a lot more with a lot less. So I believe that's a huge potential here for a lot of entrepreneurs to actually start new ventures because they can do a lot more, they can get a lot faster. They don't have to have, you know, incredible amount of capital to actually go ahead and, and build a product, right? You can build those a lot faster and you can get more product market fit a lot faster or you can test things a lot faster, so to speak. Yeah. So, and, and that's an interesting point because I, I think what I'm hearing you say is maybe this is administration and neutral uh, or agnostic. The new companies that emerge from this phase of AI could look so different that the traditional entrepreneurship route that creates a very wealthy company with hundreds of people, it will be just one or two uh, founders because a tech stack that is AI native or AI first could really accomplish as much as 100 people, right? So, and that's really interesting to see how this government starts thinking about that, if anything, in 
allowing for this ecosystem to flourish or basically grow organically. That's an interesting thing. Yeah, when you look at when you look at education, a lot of folks are, are scared because of the you know, there's a lot of chatter on hey, we're going to remove or we're going to dissolve the Department of Education, right? Or we're going to shrink it down or reform it and so on and so forth. So that's a fear that happens. I don't think that's going to happen. That's going to be almost impossible to accomplish. But what you're going to see is a need for efficiency in a lot of these different areas. And it, and Department of Education is going to be one of those. How can you fuck up the, the, the FAFSA, this, this big application that we talked about it, millions and hundreds of millions of dollars going into the development of this, of this product, and it was, it was still not tested, and, and just, just the incompetence of like having rolling out a product that affected so many different people, and the efficiency was, was very, you know, very, very bad. So what we're probably going to see is going to be a kind of a, a driver towards efficiency. So you're not going to have as big, but the impact can potentially be really, really important. So I, I think that's going to, that's going to be very helpful for sure. This is a good segue on, on something that I'd love for you to read and I'd love to hear your thoughts. I don't know what you think about this efficiency angle that it's, it's seems that it's coming our way. So let, let, let me just, you know, set the stage here. This election, as it relates to AI, was not the election that we thought it would be as civic as we thought of AI as, you know, all these campaigns of disinformation and exactly. like these crazy things that we thought we're going to see, uh, I don't know, Biden in a bikini dancing with Trump uh, uh, with a monkey on his shoulders and all of a sudden like saying different crazy things. We thought this election was going to be dominated by fakes and deep fakes, right. and it was not. This election, however, was the election of what we call the podcasts, candidates going into mediums like yours and I to basically diffuse the message, the infamous three-hour uh, interview with Trump and, oh my gosh, uh, Austin. Rogan. Biggest, uh, Rogan, of course, yeah. Rogan. Kamala starting with, you know, basically appealing to certain markets and both Kamala and Trump doing that. So the election of the podcast. But the other thing that this election was, was an Elon election, right? Um, his involvement in the Trump campaign and his approach showcased there. Why? So this is why I want to connect it. As I said, it was going to take me a time to set it up. Why? Because there's this assumption that his view of efficiency, it's going to hit the government and then we may be seeing that. So I know that you are a big fan of what he does and you have sometimes a student of some of uh, his approaches. What do you think is going to happen here? A quest for efficiency, AI and efficiency are always in the same sentence for you and I. So now that you put a influence figure that has crushed efficiency for multiple ways, what do you think happens and how do we benefit or not from that in our world of AI and all things higher ed? I mean, there's a lot to unpack in there. So this idea of efficiency, look, it would be very delusional to think that that Elon is going to come into the government and actually make the impact that Minister that, of Efficiency. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's gonna it's gonna take a while, right? And and once you it, it takes a while to unravel the bureaucracy and, and you know, all of the different systems. So everything is gonna work against so you. So I should not expect a sink coming into the uh, department of uh, budget or what's it called? <laughs> o o o o OPTS? <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, that might be, um, I, I was going to say there is the reality and then there is the signaling and there is also the, there's a lot of people that are focused on that, that they want to do the right thing and they, their, their views and how they want to work it, but they haven't been given the opportunity to do that. So this perhaps allows folks who are already part of the system to, you know, to actually contribute towards a more efficient government, but without having to be, you know, we work in academia, right? In academia, there is, there's just so much bureaucracy when you start thinking about budgets. Think about the budget, like, let's take that for example. Both you and I managed budgets. You had a much bigger budget than I did, of course, but so what did you do when you had budget left? Like, you didn't go and say, hey, CFO, here is an extra, you know, five hundred thousand dollars. There's that zero, zero incentives to have money left. 
Correct. In today's budgeting area, right? So what happens when you have money left is that you got to play a corporate political game and there's multiple ways that gets manifested. That's a whole different podcast, but yeah. Zero incentives to leave money to in the table, zero. Exactly. So, so it's the same thing that we can, you know, it happens in universities. Like, mm -hmm. why wouldn't you operate from an efficiency or zero based budget or things like that? Like, why wouldn't you operate from, I, I need some certain outcomes and then we drive funding but when you're allocating money across and you're peanut butter spreading it everywhere, then everybody's incentive, it's localized and meaning that they care about their own little world and how to make that world and, and gain more influence and gain more influence. So we're, it, it's going to be really interesting. I don't think that's going to, it's going to be very difficult for Elon to come in and, and actually unravel that. But maybe, maybe what's going to happen is He's going to focus on one or two departments if we can get that maybe some of the companies we can accelerate the adoption of kind of this innovative new companies actually working with government to accelerate things so like um you know things like we don't have things like boeing for example being entrenched and and spending the government spending billions and billions of dollars and stranding our astronauts <laughs> you know mm. it's like how did we get to that point where the amount of money that we're spending with it with with Boeing or or some of the incumbents, like the really large organizations, like we can't move away from those. And then you really, you almost have to be really big in order to, uh, bureaucratic in order to fit into that system. So hopefully what we'll see is an opportunity for the smaller guys or for the more efficient guys to play in that playground and open the door. And that will filter down then to uh, some of the efficiencies. But you can't just go in and cut stuff out, but you can make regulation to allow, you know, the, the market to come in and, and smaller companies to play in the playground. But look at this logic model, and it's be, it'll be very interesting for us to, you know, go out of there for like a few more minutes, because if you were to connect the dots, all things being AI, it's a really interesting conversation. So that number one, this in, in common government, it's, you know, not big government. Republicans like to be basically more lean, relative more lean as it relates to administration, right? Right. Dot number two, Elon supposed to have an efficiency angle towards, you know, what he's done before. We've seen his approach to verticalization. We've seen how he's done really well through, you know, space exploration and like figuring that out and like the quest for efficiency and reusable rockets. We'd see him fired half of the staff at X, right? And then the product still goes on, right? And so on and so forth. Exhibit number three, all things AI are the quest for efficiency, right? So I think that it's a really interesting thing that if you were to connect the dots, we're maybe saying that this administration may be deploying more AI because the natural way to achieve smaller government efficiency all, and then when someone like Elon, maybe we suppose that it's going to be around, it will be a natural recommendation. So it'd be, for me, it's an interesting logic model, and maybe it does happen. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that's there's one, one component that goes hand in hand with what I was just saying, like, hey, this is very innovative companies that are, are springing up right now. It's like, how do, you, how do they work with government and how do they work to, to make these systems more efficient and to kind of leapfrog so we're using ai to accelerate those things but the government is not building that stuff internally right that's that's like that's what we like they have to work with with companies and industry to bring that stuff in and the companies that are actually doing that work are the ones that are newer and they don't have the the foothold in in government so what this allows then is to bring that technology in um, one way that we saw it is you know perhaps meta like has has open source llama and there's there's news that the you know china has has been using llama without the obviously the permission llama 3 without permission for military uses and and they're adopting it and they're using it for that obviously that's not allowed however so now meta has opened up their licensing so government it can be used for government use and military use and so on and so forth so you're going to see a lot more, I would say, a lot more of that where, you know, something being used for military use or for government use. And 
the larger organizations like Google and employees who are in those organizations. If you saw, I don't know, if it was eight years ago in 2016 and so on and so forth, everything that was, oh, we're going to collaborate with the military, we're going to collaborate with the government, you know, everybody, there was this reaction internally on this large organizations, on the employees themselves that it's like they start quitting or, or you know, kind of this, this back flack. We're not going to see, we're not seeing that now. And that's probably going to be one of the ways that that's going to, that we're going to benefit from that, or at least the government and, and this new administration is going to benefit from it. It'd be very interesting to play this out to your point about the effects of the the approach that this administration has on America first and our rivals, economic rivals. So with the Biden and the prior administration, we saw the semiconductors bill, right? One of the biggest ingredients for AI and the benefits that we have today through AI, it's on compute, right? And the power, right? And, and, it, Divya, yeah, yeah. and Divya and many of, of those right now are trying to figure out how do they do what they do without China, right? I will be... I don't know how it will manifest itself, but to your point about China benefiting from R&D that comes from here, that right now is actually free because it's open source, it'd be very interesting. Does that mean tariffs? Does that mean barriers? Does that mean interesting localization? Or no, you cannot extend this technology over there. I don't know. But there's a really interesting conversation about what does it mean to apply a U.S. first agenda to AI, the LLMs, the software, as we've seen it on the semiconductors today. Competitive advantage is real, and right now through LLMs, there is a gigantic competitive advantage and commercialization behind it. Thoughts? Um, no, I think we're there's going to be even more of an incentive to to accelerate these large labs that are building frontier models and the regulations moving out of the way plus the ability for energy to now, you know, tap into other sources of energy that were kind of taboo or, or, or restricted before. So we don't have to, I mean, we can still use natural gas and drilling and, and, and on oil and all that stuff. So I don't think those are going to be the barriers going forward, at least for the next four years. And of course, we'll start building more of uh, nuclear and so on and so forth. So the energy unlock or the barrier on the energy side, I would say, kind of removes the acceleration for the frontier uh, labs to build better and better and bigger and bigger data centers and models. Yeah. And artists, I think maybe it's a good segue to the story that you were commenting at the beginning, because what we are saying, in a way, if you get the spirit of the conversation, we think that is this administration will be AI friendly. And the stories that we we see today on the news will become a reality, right? And and then this is kind of connecting dots. A small startup in a garage type of uh, you know place becomes a two billion dollar <laughs> companies overnight with two three uh, professionals, and they would displace an incumbent that has maybe five x a penetration on the market or capitalization, right? So many, many more stories probably will come. So can we unpack this check study uh, story and how chat GPT basically displaces an organization that has been a stable for educational discovery and supporting teens for years? Yeah. So if, if you're not familiar with Chegg, Chegg started, it's a study guide repository, right? And it started really early on, um, I believe like in the- 15 years ago or so? Right, exactly. Um, where it was, you know, students sharing study guides and then it became a textbook sharing site and then eventually became a place where you can go into and pay a subscription and get answers to textbook problems, right? So you have a textbook, that being uh, math or or, whatever it was, right? So all of these quizzes and answers in those textbooks that usually when we were in college, we got those from um, from other people who were Cliff ahead notes. of us. Cliff notes. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. But if you're, if you'd like, if they're technical stuff, right? If it's technical, like we usually got it from the, like you you knew somebody the who took the gave class us before. The exactly, exactly. I, ne I never got a midterm exam and differential equations from anybody that took it their prior year. I never that, got that. Uh, that's really interesting. <laughs> So, so Chegg became a really popular site and they went public. 
By the way, 2006, that's when they uh, were founded, 2006. Exactly, exactly. So their, their model was, you know, 1995 a month for these pre-written answers to textbooks and questions. So from 2021 it, it, to today, he has lost 99% of the value. The stock has lost 99% of the value. So it's erased 14.5 billion in market value, which is incredible. This is, they disappeared. Exactly. By the way, and this is a ramp up. Uh, they kind of go public. Uh, let me see this. 2006, and it's basically in 2013, they go public, right? So this is the past 11 years, right? Or in this case, 10 years. It was that ramp up and literally uh, basically free fall thereafter, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So so the idea here is that, you know, well, not the idea, but once ChatGPT got introduced and they saw a decline in users uh, using their site and they did not adopt fast enough, right? One of the things that they mention in, from internal, the article mentions is people internally were asking the company for resources to build AI and to test and to deploy AI systems internally, and they weren't given enough resources or resources at all. They were denied resources. So what that means to me is that the leadership had no idea that this AI thing was going to be that impactful or that big and kind of what the outcome of that was for their business. So in 2023, the uh, CEO of, of Chegg was on stage at ASU GSV and released what they called Checkmate, which was a chatbot companion to answer questions. It wasn't very good. The adoption was still low. People internally said, it was just really, really bad and, and like didn't, didn't, you know, was not kind of the answer to what they were looking for. The market didn't move. So they kept on losing market share, kept on losing market share. They've done a lot of work to kind of infuse AI throughout their products and, and to kind of help build answers. Now, when you get an answer, somebody pays $20, but they get an answer and it's, you know, it, it, it's still, it's sometimes it's AI generated. Um, however, they can go to ChatGPT and get a better answer for that. And you know, artists just to unpack what better means: the personalization, the speed, and the cost. Literally, you know, with these free versions of ChatGPT, you don't pay anything. You prompt, and as you're prompt in your style, you get a refinement of it, and just basically in the time that it takes place. In um, it, it's incredible. Anyway, keep on going. So. The, the idea here was that these guys were going to build a chat GPT with all their answers. It didn't quite work out that way. They went ahead and hired a startup called Scale AI that would create a lot of different AI systems for different academic disciplines. However, folks, the, the evolution of the AI models like chat GPT and GPT-4 and so on and so forth, they just became really, really powerful. And then the users were just getting trained to go to those different sources rather than Chegg. And the stock has kind of tumbled ever since, losing a lot of their uh, a lot of their money. There was a there was an interesting quote. It's like uh, from somebody, he said, uh, I felt scammed because uh, there was an answer that he got and it said AI generated and he got actually a better answer you know, with some of the other models, like the free chat GPT or even the anthropic one. So, so, so what, what do you take from this, JC? I mean, I give you a lot of the kind of the details of, of the company and like how AI basically arrest, erase $15 billion of market value from a company that's been around for a decade plus, very instrumental to higher education or education in general. But now we have a very, very different behavior. So what, what are your thoughts? I mean, look, 
it's it's nothing revolutionary, right? There is a cycle of innovation and technology displacement that is very natural. An incumbent sees a competitor either with traditional differentiation or better cost, or in this case, a different experience, and literally they eat their lunch. We've been seeing this for the past 100 years, so I'm not surprised. The part that is different, though, is that if I always like the marriage st uh, story, like, you know, J.W. Merritt made his money by looking at a competitor and like literally launching the same thing and uh, doing it faster, better. But what is not told and is different today is that Merritt, in this case, made his money making sodas. So he, like he knew that business and he was a supply chain expert and like all this type of things. So there was a level of expertise that is needed for you to displace the incumbent. So if I came in like us, right, we're building this super exciting student platform, but at the core we're, we're technologists, we're educators, so we have this expertise. What AI is doing is that it could displace the most random organizations without having a one-to-one -one connection or trace back to, oh, we come from the same sector. You know what I mean? ChatGPT was not meant to displace homework, educational providers. No, right? And also like, that's what, it, it took on a billion dollar company. So that's, that's what I take. Sure, it's doing what technology displacement has been doing it and it's doing at a, in a, in a, in a normal style without having the SMEs and the experts that basically geek out that sector they want to replace and doing it in a way is unintentional and way too many side effects that are taking place. That for me is different and exciting, right? Because us building it, we're the displacers uh, as opposed to uh, the ones that are gonna be displaced. So for me, that's exciting and very, very promising. Yeah. But, but I also see this as a, like essentially the value of these companies that are basically generating content. They're a system of content or giving answers or producing answers. Like this is, uh, these systems are, are, there's not a lot of proprietary stuff that's underneath there, right? So these models get better and better at reasoning and all these things. So, so the, the gold value is on, in the data. It's in the user data, the behavior, like the system being the system or record, like all these things. And everything else on the content side, we're seeing that as a layer that's going to be disrupted tremendously. Think about uh, like a learning management system, an LMS, right? And I just saw yesterday a demo from, from a startup called Pete Learning, and they focus on corporate education. And they loaded in a very heavy manual, like a, a manual from, I forget, like a security manual that or you know somebody needed to to go through and with very little prompting it essentially build three four different module outlined it actually build the learning objectives it build everything from that one manual to target the, the employees so they can go through it and learn it also did the notes underneath so it actually used like 11 labs to do the reading and the voice training for from a professor so and and the last part of that was it actually used ai to do the you know the validation or the what's the word that i'm looking for what's the word that i'm looking for it's the the assessment so it used the llms to actually do the assessment so somebody can go in and 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 chat Exams with the LLM. Exactly. The right. So you don't need all that stuff anymore, right? This LLM is like if you bake that. So essentially, these guys have reproduced the modern, you know, LMS. It's like you could just load, upload source material or a book or whatever and say, target or, or build me a five module, you know, course for this target audience. And by the way, build me the assessments as well. And, and and by the way, just you know, create voice so now this can be consumed in different places. So the content generation world, I think it's going to be really, really interesting to see. Of course, we don't play in that space in the teaching and learning space. We're mostly around uh, the engagement, but the content generation is is an area that we're focusing quite a bit on around like how do you how do you use this 
to accelerate content generation? Is it going to be, it's going to be really, really interesting to see like how, how service providers through higher education are going to adopt to, to the AI wave, like folks who are building, you know, campaigns or folks who are building marketing material. And this is kind of, you know, interesting because this is AMA and American Marketing Association for Higher Ed conference that's happening right now. So, so I don't want to talk, I don't want to kind of talk about the existential threat to, to, to kind of content providers or content generators and agencies, but it's, uh, it's an area where we're looking at it very, very closely and it's a potential disruptor for a lot of those providers there. All right, artists, I think we are reaching our desired time and attention grabs of all our awesome followers. We've been having a conversation about where we see this incoming government uh, benefiting our AI agendas. Our talking points have been there's probably going to be a replacement to the current AI act, given that governments tend to do that. We think that this organization is going to be friendly to AI. There's a natural aspect there from efficiency, lower and uh, less government. We also f think that MMA merger acquisitions and the funding pipes will allow the AI ecosystem to basically proliferate more companies, faster innovation, if you will. And we also suspect that there's going to have a connotation of America first, right? And then it's going to be very interesting to see how it touches on software because we already see how it could look like on the hardware that powers all these uh, AI. And we're excited about that. And for our AI agenda, I think it's a good, it's going to be a good interest in observations that we need to do. Any last thoughts as I recapped and kind of gave everybody the, sur the, the summary of what we think we could be observing in the next coming months and in years? Now for us as technologists is in a very, very exciting kind of space. I know a lot of folks are in a interesting spot right now as, as the outcomes of the yeah, election, but you know, once, once, you know, not a lot of stuff changes for, for those of us who work in, in companies and technology as we move forward. If anything, things are going to accelerate. So it's a very, very exciting time for sure. Yeah, yeah. And as a reminder, this conversation is not a reflection of our excitement or the lack thereof as, you know, our political affiliations is not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is really where AI and this administration commingle. And I'm sorry, these texts are coming my way. And um, how we basically see that it may be a bull market. So thank you, everybody. Exciting times ahead. Until next time, and we'll see you around. Bye, everybody. Generation AI is part of the Enrollify podcast network. If you like this podcast, chances are you're going to like other Enrollify shows too. Our podcast network is growing weekly, and we've got a wide range of marketing, enrollment, and higher ed technology shows that are jam-packed with stories, ideas, and frameworks, all designed to empower you to be a better higher ed professional. Our shows help higher ed leaders and professionals like you find their next big idea. They feature a selection of the industry's best as your hosts, like Jamie Hunt, Seth O'Dell, Jenny Lee Fowler, Brian Gross, and many of your favorite leaders in higher ed. Enrollify is made possible by Element 451, the next generation AI student engagement platform that's helping institutions all over the country create meaningful, personalized, and engaging connections with their prospects and students. Learn more at element451.com.